Today on the Women Mind the Water Artivist series, I am excited to talk with Margaret Wertheim. Margaret is an Australian-born science writer and artist who, with her twin sister, founded a nonprofit that explores the interrelationship of art, science, mathematics, and women's handiwork. Margaret and I will focus on the Crochet Coral Reef, a project that has become a global collaboration between thousands of needlework artisans. The Women Mind the Water Art of a Series podcast on womenmindthewater.com engages artists in conversation about their work and explores their connection with the ocean. Through their stories, Women Mind the Water hopes to inspire and encourage action to protect the ocean and her creatures. I am thrilled today to have Margaret Wartime on the Women Mind the Water Art of a Series podcast. Margaret holds degrees in mathematics and physics. Margaret and her twin sister, Christine, originated the Crochet Coral Reef Project in response to climate change. The Wertheim's Crochet Coral has become a collaborative art project. A major exhibition of the project in Germany earlier this year involved a community of 4,000 contributors of over 40,000 corals. I highly recommend that listeners watch the video version of this podcast on womenmindthewater.com to see the colorful variety of coral that has been produced. At the heart of this project are women and math, two data sets that are sometimes thought to be unrelated. Welcome, Margaret. I am looking forward to our discussion about corals, math, art, and global collaboration. Let's start with an early chapter in your story. I believe you and your twin sister, Christine, grew up in Australia. Did you grow up near the coast? I ask because I wonder if this is somehow at the root of your fascination with coral. We grew up in Brisbane, which is uh, not on the coast, but not far from a place called the Gold Coast, which is a very famous international uh, beach resort. So we used to go to the beach a lot as children. But the Great Barrier Reef is actually like... um, a thousand miles to the north of where we grew up so we did we didn't actually grow up diving or going to coral reefs but like all australians the great barrier reef weighs very heavily on the consciousness of australians because we're all aware that it's very fragile and that we're the custodians of it for now so those of us who have not had the experience of having a twin may be interested to hear what role your sister played in your personal development how has christine inspired or challenged you Christine and I um, have had an interesting kind of parallel lives in that she's long been attracted to art and I've long been attracted to science. When we finished high school, she went to art school and I went to university of physics and math. So she's had a kind of life in art as a professional artist in our college, professor teaching art, and I've had a life in science, uh, being a science writer and science communicator. And so our lives have kind of woven together. And we don't really see art and science as being, as it were, diametrically opposed. To us, it's always been two things that have interwoven through both of our lives. The ultimate collaboration. Another element in your work is feminism. Is there a particular aspect of the feminine journey that you're exploring with your projects? It's something that we grew up with. Our mother... um, went from being a Catholic mother of six to being one of the leaders of the feminist movement in the state where we grew up. And she, in fact, was instrumental in opening the first women's shelters in Australia. So feminism has been a huge influence in our life. And our project does definitively have a feminist dimension because it's not only a project in which most of the participants are women of the 20,000 people who participated, 99% of them have been women. But we are very specifically aware that we want to highlight the value and the beauty and the creative potential of women's domestic labours. So the project is based on crochet, and we're we're crocheting artistic objects. Um, This is an art project. There's nothing functional about it. But we are very aware that the technique we are using came from doing domestic handicrafts that had utilitarian purpose, like making clothes or making tablecloths. And for us, we want to keep that association and say, look, domestic feminine labor not only was functional, 
but it can lead to works of extraordinary beauty and aesthetic power. Am I uh, correct in thinking that this started as a mathematical exploration? And why would a mathematician be interested in coral? The project has multiple roots. One of them is in feminism. One of them is in ecology, trying to draw attention to the plight of living reefs. And one of the uh, roots of the project is mathematics, because the frilly curling shapes you can make with crochet are manifestations of hyperbolic geometry, which is an alternative to the Euclidean geometry that we learn in school. And those shapes, it turns out, are the shapes that actual coral reef organisms make. So, you know, corals and nudibranchs and sea sponges and kelps all have these sort of frilly curling shapes that we all distinctively recognize. And they are actually a radical kind of geometry that mathematicians only discovered in the 19th century after spending centuries trying to prove that they were impossible. But it took almost 200 years for anybody to realize how it was possible to make a model of one of these things. And that discovery was made by a mathematician at Cornell named Dr. Diana Tamina in the early 90s. She discovered how you could make models of these you know, supposedly impossible shapes using the art of crochet. And she was making these things to teach non-Euclidean mathematics to her and students at Cornell in the math department. And once we learned about the technique from her, my sister started playing around and realized that if you didn't make them mathematically perfect, if you went wild and aberrant and deviated from the proper mathematical algorithm that produces a perfect hyperbolic surface, my, it was my sister's realization that if you went wild, as it were, went off the grid, then you produce things that weren't mathematically perfect. You couldn't use them in a math classroom, but what you could do is make things that look like living objects, particularly living corals. So my sister had a bunch of these, you know, wild, aberrant, non-perfectly mathematical ones on the coffee table, and they were sitting there and we thought, oh my gosh, they look like a coral reef. And my sister said, we could crochet a coral reef. So the innovation of our project is to realize that if you deviated from mathematical perfection, you got things that looked like living forms. I, I love the metaphor, you know, men say that women, are, you can't understand them. And then you t say that, you know, some woman who explored the math that's not possible and made it possible. That's, that's lovely. I like that. So well, I, I should clarify that, that, the, that the mathematicians had discovered this geometric form about okay. 200 years ago. What they did. So they had this idea of this thing in their minds and they had formulas and equations to describe it. And whereas I was at university, I studied these forms in pure math classes. The thing was that they understood them as um, a formal structure that they could describe with equations, but they didn't know how to make a physical model of it. I got it. So, so there are two things. One is understanding that the thing exists mathematically and you can make formula to describe it the other thing is can you have a physical material model that i can hold in my hands to show people what this thing looked like and that was the part that they didn't have until mm -hmm. dr jamina came along which also raised an interesting question because now we know that lots of things in nature make these forms like coral form like coral organisms and also lettuce leaves so it's an interesting issue how come lettuce leaves and corals were making these structures but mathematicians thought they couldn't exist right so apparently you and christine were entirely responsible for all the handiwork in the first exhibition of crochet coral i imagine that you dreamed about crocheting every night and for that exhibit did you pre-design each piece or did the coral take shape organically? There is a collection of coral reefs that myself and my sister make. Right. And that gets exhibited all over the world in places like the Venice Biennale or um, they've been at the Smithsonian, many, many other places, the New, um, Museum of Art and Design in New York. So we do an ongoing set of large-scale coral sculptures that get exhibited in a lot of places. 
And in those works, there is a small bunch of very skilled contributors around the world who contributed some individual pieces from those. Mm -hmm. In addition to that side of the project, we, we also work with communities in places like what New York, London, Abu Dhabi, Sydney, just recently a huge one in Germany, one in Finland. And what happens in that sense is that we work with the communities to help the communities build a crochet coral reef of their own that gets exhibited locally and is made by hundreds and sometimes many thousands of local people. Both these aspects of the project are ongoing. So my sister and I continue to make new reef sculptures and we continue to work with communities to make their own ones that are, are made by their local people. I see. So I'm a great believer in the value of collaboration. I know it's not easy to arrive at a truly collaborative effort. Your exhibition in Germany earlier this year had 4,000 contributors and 40,000 Carl. This is a monumental tribute to collaboration. How did the Crochet Coral Project come to be such a mass of collaboration? It has really surprised and astounded us how much this project has taken off. So from the beginning when we first imagined the project, we wanted to have other people involved. And I just put up a little call on our website asking for people who might want to contribute corals to just send me stuff. And a few people did. And then we had an idea in our first big exhibition in Chicago at the Chicago Cultural Center where we invited the people of Chicago to contribute corals to a reef that we would make with them. And we got 300 people. And then we got invited to do it in New York. Then we got invited to do it in London. And it's just kept growing and growing that lots of institutions want to do community participatory projects. And it's actually very hard to come up with good participatory projects. It's really difficult to design one. And this project has really taken off, I think, because it's a very, very good way of engaging people both in a collaborative artistic project while also engaging them in the subject of climate change, which is you know, potentially the most important topic of our time, and so giving them, as it were, access to learning about some of the foundations of mathematics. So the project combines art and science, environmentalism, mathematics and community making. And I think it's that confluence of things that draws so many people into it. And we keep, we don't really promote the project and, you know, run around asking institutions to join us in this. What happens is that the phone rings or the emails come in and some institution in Abu Dhabi or Switzerland or Venice or wherever says, we would like you we would like to do a crochet coral reef project with you. Do you want to do it with us? And I think it's because of the incredible timeliness of the topic um, in global warming and, and the confluence of art and science that this project organically brings together. Do you see patterns in the work of regional groups, maybe in the colors they use or the shapes or the type of yarn? There hasn't really been huge distinctions in, uh, as it were, types of reefs. Every community who does it brings, you know, everyone is unique and different and its own thing. Some of them, you know, they like to hang things on the walls. Some people like to hang things from the ceiling. Most people sort of now follow up the model that we've developed. And, and do sort of big islands in the middle of the room, which you know we try to encourage people to go up as much as possible. There hasn't really been any, you know, as it were, thematic patterns. The one thing I will say is um, over time, all of the reefs, including our own, started off being pretty small and low down to the ground. And as time has gone on, the project's been going for 17 years now. My as goodness. time has gone on, it, we've developed techniques for going up and up and getting ever taller, taller structures. And we've shown these techniques to the people, the communities we work with, and they've gone up and up. So the whole thing has kind of grown organically, literally from, you know, it's followed the path of evolution of life on earth in a way, you know, life on earth begins with 
pond scum, you know, on the bottom of a shallow seabed. And then gradually it evolves and goes upwards and upwards and eventually you get, you know, towering redwood forests. And our project has uncannily followed the path of evolution in that sense too, that it's we've gradually learned and taught our communities the way of going up. But the other thing that's beautiful about this in an evolutionary sense is that, you know, just as life on Earth starts from simple cells and gradually evolves ever more complex, and eventually you get, you know, huge diversity like peacocks and giraffes, well, so too with our project, everybody learns the same basic crochet algorithm that Dr. Taimina invented. But then the real challenge is how do you diversify? How do you complexify? How do you um, make things that are as different as possible and over the 17 years of the project we've now developed what we call a whole crochet tree of life where there's really a huge taxonomic variety of different kind of crochet coral species as we like to call them that's lovely so tell us about your new book about the crochet coral project what is its focus and are there lots of photos uh, we have a glorious new book out that was published in conjunction with our amazing show in Germany at the Museum Frieda Berda. And it's got almost 200 pages of glorious photos, both from the history of the project, the work that we've done um, over the decade and a half. And it's also got magnificent photos of the German show itself and of this huge, huge reef that we made with the people of Germany, which had over 40,000 corals in it, which is really just quite a mind blowing. It's really hard to imagine 40,000 corals. And the book has essays about the mathematical, scientific, and community and environmental and feminist aspect of the project. So it's this beautiful celebration of multi diversity and the interdisciplinarity of the project. It, the, the name of the book is Value and Transformation of Corals. Are you working on any new projects? Yes, uh, both Christine and I are working on new projects. Um, I'm, uh, I came to this project through being a science writer and I've written a lot of books um, about the history of physics and I have a new book that I'm just starting working on about the history of physics, which is looking at the concept of dimensionality. So what do we mean if we say something is two-dimensional or three-dimensional or four-dimensional? And it relates to the coral reef in a way because the, the coral reef structures, um, although they look three-dimensional, are actually two-dimensional, which is sort of confusing to a lot of people. Yes. So I'm very interested in this, this concept of dimensionality and what do we mean when we say something has a certain number of dimensions. And it's also a crucially important um, issue, not just in mathematics, but it, it's the foundation of a lot of physics and it's foundational idea in a whole lot of big data science on now. Okay. So I'm putting, I'm sort of putting on my science hat again, um, having spent the last 10 years or so mixing primarily, being primarily being an artist. In terms of expression and marine concerns, like what is happening to the corals, do you have any advice for listeners on how they might use their talents and passions to make a difference? I think that the message that I have learned from this project is that we have to operate to solve global warming on multiple levels. We need government action, we need corporate action, and we need personal action. And I think what all of us can do to contribute to the solving the problem is really be aware of our own consumption. So one particular part of the project that's become very important in that respect is the fact that we have a lot of, um, we have a part of the project where we crochet plastic. And we did that in response to the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and those big walls of plastic that are killing so many marine And we decided that we needed to become aware very much of our own plastic use. And we've really made a concerted effort to really, really, really try to cut down on the amount of plastic we consume and use. And I do think that for the health of the oceans, this is something that we all need to do is really, really, really try to cut down how much plastic you use in your daily life. I love that. So, Margaret, I am really pleased that you've been on the podcast. Stick around afterwards because I'd like to ask you a few questions. My mind is blown that it is your project has grown so big and that there's so many corals that have been created. It's truly a testament to collaboration 
and women's work and the um, interrelationship of art and science. I hope our listeners have gained a new appreciation for math, mother nature, and artistic expression. I'd like to remind listeners that I have been speaking with Margaret Wertheim for the Women Mind the Water Artivist Series podcast. The series can be viewed on womenmindthewater.com, Museum on Main Street, and YouTube. An audio-only version of this podcast is also available on the womenmindthewater.com, on iTunes, and on BizFeed. Women Mind the Water is grateful to Jane Rice for the use of her song, Women of Water. All rights for the Women Mind the Water name and logo belong to Pam Ferris Olson. This is Pam Ferris Olson.